ان المتقين في مقام نمين في جنات وعيون يلبسون من سندس واستبرق متقابلين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Folks in the comments, before I even get started with this video, refrain from mocking Ahmadis. I am trying to put out a presentation here, one that's based on facts, not on emotions. I do not need people in the comments getting between Ahmadis and the truth. So please refrain from the mockery. Ahmadis that are watching this video, some of you have been Ahmadis for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Would it now be the time for you to test yourself and test why you believe in Ahmadiyya. If you've been upon falsehood your whole life, wouldn't now be the best time for you to turn it around and to follow the truth? So bear with me and please watch this video until the end. You owe it to yourself to test yourself. You owe it to yourself to test Mirza Ghulam Ahmed and his prophecies. In this video, I'm going to be sharing the top 10 failed prophecies by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. They're going to be, inshallah, from chronological order, from the earliest to the latest. Why am I making this video? Well, it's not for money, the channel's not monetized, it's not for cloud, I can care less about cloud. I'm making like, what, one, two videos per month. That's not what I'm after. I want to bring the truth to you. So please keep an open mind, watch this video with sincerity, review it, take some notes, ask your teachers, ask your mashayikh, and before even starting off, please repeat after me. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Let's start. According to Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, he received a revelation in the year 1865 that he would die at around the age 80, give or take a few years. He really took this prophecy seriously and says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will extend his life so that his opponents don't say that Allah caused him to die early. Well, decades later in the year 1907, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed wrote a book called Haqiqatul Wahi. In it, he reaffirms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would prolong his life to the age of 80, give or take five years. At the time of him writing the book, he was 67 years old, as he admits right here. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed died a year later, in the year 1908. To counter this, you'll find notable Qadianis, including Mirza Ghulam Ahmed's son, Mahmoud, claiming that his father was actually born in 1835. However, the math doesn't really add up. Who are we going to believe? The man himself who made the prophecy, or his son that is trying to save his father's credibility? Oh, and uh, Mirza Mahmoud was the second caliph of the Ahmadis, so he kind of needed to push for a higher date so that his father's prophecy could be seen as fulfilled. In the year 1879, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed receives a revelation. The will of God Almighty is turning towards bestowing mercy upon you. But if you revert to sin and disobedience, we shall also revert to punishment and chastisement. We have made hell a place of confinement for disbelievers. He says in Ibrahim Lahmadiya, volume 4, page 382, this verse indicates the glorious coming of Hadrat al Masih. Of course, no Qadiani believes in this today because Mirza Ghulam Ahmed later claimed in the year 1891 that he received a new revelation in a Tathkira, page 240. God has sent me and has disclosed to me through his special revelation that al Masih ibn Maryam had died. So basically, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed received a revelation in 1879, explained it by saying that Jesus is coming back, then 12 years later in 1891, said that he received a new revelation that Jesus is dead. Oh, and of course, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, now in Tathkira, page 244, claims to be the Messiah, the son of Mary. So we have two types of revelations. We have the ambiguous revelations and the clear revelations. Now, in regards to the ambiguous revelations, we need someone to interpret them. Unfortunately, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, apparently, can make mistakes when it comes to interpreting revelations, and he will make false prophecies based on those revelations. Unfortunately, sometimes those um, interpretations and prophecies 
last for over a decade without being corrected. In this case, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed did not even know his identity. He did not even know that he is supposed to be the Messiah. What I find really interesting about the initial revelation is that it has nothing to do with Jesus at all. Such an interpretation would only be presented by someone that has or at least claims to have access to some sort of divine knowledge. At around the year 1881, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed claimed that he had received a revelation that said, Bikrun wa thayyib, meaning a virgin and a widow. He explained, God has intended to bring two women to me in marriage, the first time a virgin and the second time a widow. The first part of the revelation relating to a virgin has been fulfilled by Allah's grace. I have four sons from that wife. I await fulfillment of the part about the widow. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed died without getting married to a widow. His son, Mirza Bashir Ahmed, attempts to reinterpret the prophecy. He says, in my humble opinion, both aspects of the revelation were fulfilled in the person of Hadrat Aman Jan, who was a virgin and remained behind as a widow, Allah knows best. Of course, this is a distortion of the prophecy, and Mirza Ghulam Ahmed clearly understood it to be referring to him getting married to a widow. Now, what's the purpose of having a prophecy in the first place? Well, it's to bolster the claim uh, of a prophet that he has access to the knowledge of the unseen. In this case, it's backfiring against Mirza Ghulam Ahmed because he himself is duped into assuming something and he tries to uh, strive towards it. Uh, unfortunately, it defeats the whole purpose of a prophecy. In 1882, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed published the third volume of Al-Barahin al-Ahmadiyya. The following prophecy about the Jews can be found within. Therefore, God has forever tied up the hands of the Jews, so that if their views and plans have any worth, let them try to capture the governments and kingdoms of the world. They have been smitten with abasement. That is, wherever they dwell, they shall do so in ignominy and servitude, and it is, has been destined for them that they shall not live honorably in any land except in subjection to other nations. Of course, we know how that turned out. In around the year 1886, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed speaks of a prophecy that he had received. This prophecy was recorded in Hariqatul Wahi, page 277, which was written and published in the year 1907. In any case, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed claims that he received a revelation 20 years ago about him receiving four sons. He claims that all of them would live long lives. Not too long after publishing this book, Mubarak Ahmed got very sick and thus a new prophecy was revealed, implying that he would die soon. And yes, he died in 1907. He did not live long. Throughout the years, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed started to have dreams after the birth of his son that his son Mubarak Ahmed was quite sick. Now, that's kind of him trying to take a prophecy back, and at the end of the day, it's the initial prophecy that counts. What's the point of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling him that his sons are going to live long, when in reality, one of them, at least this specific one, was going to die early? On the 20th of February, 1886, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed received a revelation that spoke of the arrival of his son. A handsome and pure boy is coming as your guest. His name is Emmanuel, and also Bashir. He has been invested with the spirit of holiness, and he is free from all impurity. He is the light of Allah. Blessed is he who comes from heaven. He will be accompanied with grace, which shall arrive with him. He will be characterized with grandeur, greatness, and wealth. He will come into the world and will heal many of their disorders through his messianic qualities and through the blessings of the spirit of holiness. He is the word of Allah, for Allah's mercy and honor have equipped him with the word of majesty. He will be extremely intelligent and perceptive and will be meek of heart and will be filled with secular and spiritual knowledge. On the 7th of August, 1887, Bashir was born to Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, and on that date, he received a new revelation. We have sent this child as a witness, affirming good things, and as a warner, he is like heavy rain, in which there are diverse kinds of darknesses, as well as thunder and lightning. 
All of these things are under his two feet. In any case, the boy dies in November 1887. So this prophecy had to be reinterpreted. Notice how we have this addition between the brackets. Will follow after he departs, which really has nothing to do with the context, since the revelation is pretty clear that Bashir is supposed to have control, since all of these things are under his two feet. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed states that he received a revelation December 1, 1888. And it he says that God Almighty has disclosed to me that the prophecy of February 20, 1886 prophesied the birth of two blessed boys. He later explains that this section is referring to one son and this section is referring to another son. Of course, there's no indication from the text that this is referring to two boys, but it seems to be referring to one person. Notice how Bashir who is actually unimportant, since he dies so soon after, is referred to by name, while the alleged promised reformer child isn't even worth mentioning by name. Well, that's because the text is supposed to be about one person, not about two. This understanding, presented by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, isn't convincing, which is why even his own relations saw this as a failed prophecy. Okay, so this one has a lot of elements in it. It's kind of complicated, but please do try to follow along. In May 1888, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed received uh, a revelation and multiple prophecies about Muhammadi Begum. He was instructed to go to her father to ask her hand in marriage. In a tafkira, it says, but if they declined this offer, the girl would suffer great distress. In such case, the person whom she marries would die within two and a half years of the date of the marriage, and her father would die within three years of that date. The death is decreed within three years of the marriage. He continues, in those days, when I repeatedly sought detail and particularization, I was told that God had determined that after removing every obstacle, he would, in the end, bring about the marriage of the elder daughter of Ahmed Beg with me. Long story short, Muhammad Begum is actually married off to someone else, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed is rejected. And in the year 1892, the father actually dies, which seems to be a fulfillment of Mirza Ghulam Ahmed's prophecy. However, in 1883, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed had already predicted that Ahmed Beg was about to die. Five years later, in 1888, he was still alive. The prophecy then changed to within three years after the marriage. The marriage occurred in 1892. Three years from then would have been 1895. So anything within that time frame would have been considered a fulfilled prophecy by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. Of course, when someone says this person is about to die, they don't usually mean within 12 years, especially if you factor in life expectancy in India during that period. Now back to Muhammad Begum. In the year 1891, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed reaffirms his marriage intentions and claims that it actually occurred, the marriage itself actually occurred in heaven. She gets married the next year, though, to someone else, and continues to stay married. The father then dies. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed reaffirms the prophecy in Karamat al-Sadiqin, which was actually originally written in Arabic, and he says there is a year left until his death, referring to the husband of Muhammad e. Begum. Of course, nothing happens, and almost two years after the original prophecy, we get this clarification in Al-Barahin, Volume 5. Hence, when God saw the fear of those people, he delayed the part of the prophecy that related to the death of the son-in-law, in keeping with his promise. Now, people need to realize something. A prophecy isn't simply uh, tied to the people that are involved in the prophecy. A prophecy is for all to see. Remember, a prophecies are made to bolster the claims of those that claim to be prophets. So this alleged fear of the husband of Muhammad e. Begum, or the fear of Muhammad e. Begum, or whomever, should not affect the prophecy coming to pass. The very fact that this prophecy doesn't come to pass simply provides ammo to those that reject Mirza Ghulam Ahmed. Also, if the husband of Muhammad e. Begum and if Muhammad e. Begum were truly living in fear, then why were they still married to one another in the first place? So the prophecy fails at all three points. The father does not die soon, as Mirza Ghulam Ahmed had initially predicted in the year 1883. The son-in-law outlived Mirza Ghulam Ahmed by a few decades, and Muhammad e. Begum was never married off to Mirza Ghulam Ahmed.
In early June 1893, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed had a 15-day debate with Abdullah Atham, a Christian apologist. At the end of the debate, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed announced the following, which you can find in his book, Holy War, pages 287-288, based on a revelation that he had received. He gave me the sign in the form of a glad tiding that in this debate, whichever party from among the two is deliberately adopting falsehood and abandoning the true God, and is making a mere mortal into a god, he will be cast into hell and utterly disgraced corresponding to the very days of this debate. In other words, taking one month for each day, meaning within 15 months, on the condition that he does not return to the truth. He continues, I now declare that if this prophecy proves false, in other words, if that party which is established on falsehood in the estimation of God Almighty is not thrown into hell, sentenced to death within 15 months from today's date, I will be ready to accept every single punishment. Of course, nothing happened in the 15 months. However, in the very last day, a new revelation was received by Mirza Ghulam Ahmed, in which he claims that God told him that Atham showed signs of sorrow and grief, so he will not be dying at that specific time. Apparently, there was a clause in the prophecy, which was that Atham would die only if he did not return to the truth. Of course, Atham denied that he ever returned to the truth and remained a Christian, which caused Mirza Ghulam Ahmed to produce another revelation, challenging Atham to swear upon his life that he didn't return to the truth. Atham refused to take the oath, which led Mirza Ghulam Ahmed to produce another prophecy about Atham's death. However, unlike the first, he did not put a time limit. Eventually, Atham passed away, but Mirza Ghulam Ahmed continued to get approached by people telling him that his initial prophecy failed. He said the following in Haqiqat al wahi page 231, indicating that even if the timing of a prophecy is incorrect, it is still an acceptable prophecy. However, I'm going to have to disagree. If God gives you a time limit for a prophecy to occur, it needs to occur at that specific time because God doesn't make mistakes. Mirza Ghulam Ahmed's standards for the fulfillment of prophecies are pretty low. On the 6th of December 1905, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed said that he had a dream about going to Delhi and coming back safely. Personally, I don't really consider this much of a prophecy since it doesn't really sound like much of a task. However, his son Mahmoud, the second caliph, clearly did see this as a prophecy and admitted that his father never fulfilled it. He said, thus this revelation contained a prophecy that the person resembling him would travel to Delhi. Mahmoud went to Delhi and then claims to be the fulfillment of the prophecy. On February 19, 1906, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed had a dream that Manzoor Muhammad would have a son. He would be referred to as Bashir al-Dawla. On the 7th of June of the same year, Mirza Ghulam Ahmed received a new revelation that this boy would also be referred to as Alam Kabab, and that a great calamity would occur after his birth. Oh, and it was also conveyed to him that he would also be known as uh, Shadi Khan and Kalimatullah Khan, and that God would keep his mother alive until he was born. Oh, and a couple of weeks later, we also learned this special boy would be named Kalimat al Aziz, Nasir al Din, and Fatah al Din. That's a lot of names. Um, not much after that, on the 9th of October 1908, the mother passes away, and Bashir al Dawla, also known as Alam Kabab is never born. Another failed prophecy. Now, before ending this video, I just um, want to share a brief message to the Ahmadis that are currently watching, still watching. Um, well, I'm happy that you've made it this far. It must have not been the easiest of tasks. Um, please do go through some of these points again. Take notes, take screenshots. Um, share the video with your teachers, with your sheikhs. Try to get answers from them, and I guarantee you, you will receive one of two things, silence or really bad answers. Now, how do you know that these are bad answers? Well, after receiving them, you come back to this video, compare the answers that you got to the points that are made in the video. And if you're not satisfied by the answers or you felt that they had nothing to do with the points that are being made or that they do not refute the points that are being made, then those are bad answers. But wait a second, let me tell you, there's some good news. The good news from this is that you now can come to the Orthodox Islam, the Islam of Ahl-Sunnah 
wal jama'a it's an islam without intermediaries an islam without false prophets muhammad peace be upon him is the final prophet after all and if you'd like to compare how a prophecy is supposed to look like then please do check out my video on the ghulibat al rum prophecy the prophecy about the romans attaining victory over the persians also a big shout out to hani tahir who is an ex ahmadian expert in ahmadiyya big shout out to him do check out his arabic channel for more i'll catch you guys in the next one assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi